Sunday night. I am back to do some uh, more keto teaching and to get uh, some of the secrets of keto out into the big wide world of the public. So as per usual, I love to see that you guys can hear me. There is a bit of a delay from when I speak to when I can see your comments. So I will uh, do a couple things that I've been trying to make a tradition of. Um, as a physician, when you look at the things that help patients uh, improve their health, it turns out that the people advising them, like their physicians, uh, have a great influence on how they um, migrate to new behaviors. So one of the things I've been doing on all of my lives is I have been showing you that, yes, indeed, I do check my sugars and I do check um, the, um, the, them specifically, pretty intensely, I think, uh, during a fast each week. So I'm just gonna start by showing you how I check my sugars. Um, and I have started my fast a little earlier today. Um, oops, I did not, uh, oh, there we go. I started my fast a little bit earlier today, um, probably around, probably a little bit before noon, right after church. Um, and that was, will be the last time I eat until I get a Dr. Bob's ratio of about 40. I try to do that once a week in hopes to hit autophagy. So again, the glucose uh, test I try to do live, showing you that 90 is where I'm at so far. This is early in my fast, and uh, this is the ketone strip. So again, it's got a purple stripe. Make sure that that little blinking blood dot is uh, flashing before you touch it to your, uh, to your test. And then the ketones just take about 10 seconds as opposed to the five seconds that the glucose takes. Um, oh, it's so good to see your comments. Thank you very much. I really appreciate learning where you guys are from. So 0.7. So uh, I've learned never do math on live, <laughs> live YouTube, but nine, 90 divided by 0 0.7, gonna put us somewhere in that 135 range, I bet. Um, if you could, uh, if somebody could do the math and post it for me, that'd be very helpful. Um, but I really appreciate the, uh, those checking in and uh, letting you know that um, one of the reasons we do the Dr. Boz ratio is because it is your feedback. I've been helping patients help change behavior for over 20 years, and one of the most important parts of changing anybody's behavior is instant feedback or really tight feedback. When you come to see me two to three times a year, and that's the only feedback you get. It is a very difficult change of, um, of the uh, person's behavior because your interaction with uh, real-time data is so delayed. So Dr. Bob's ratio is what we use in um, our in the research area, they use it in the form of a glucose ketone index that requires quite a bit of math. And most of my patients aren't, um, they aren't, you could say healthy enough, that's one word, um, for the, um, the ability to just think that much and constantly be typing out what their Dr. Bob's ratio is on top of um, uh, then knowing what to do with it. So I've done several, I, have, I see a few folks saying, hey, what is the Dr. Bob's ratio? I have several YouTube videos on that. I do see that my comments aren't quite fitting on my screen, so I wonder what happened to that. Let me just double check on that. Um, oh, well, no, they're not quite. Let me just really give me a two seconds to um, see if, why is that doing that? Hmm. Width is 265 and height 600. Jack, if you can text me what the width and height should be, I think they're wrong. Um, all right, so we'll see if we can get that fixed over the next couple of minutes. I do have a great show for you tonight. We are gonna do some reviews from some of the regulars that have come on. It is through their stories that we're gonna talk about some of the secrets to the ketogenic diet. Um, one of my most uh, thankful um, uh, uh, parts of the show are the folks who say, hey, I would like your help with the ketogenic diet. Uh, and in saying that, um, they are willing to bring their stories onto the, onto the show and use their journey as a way to teach. So I have two parts. One is uh, gonna be very interactive, so I would encourage you to stay because we're gonna use this live side chat. That's why I need Jack to tell me now what the size of it is that it's supposed to be. Um, the, 
the danger of uh, an interactive show that's live is when little things like this happen. But I'm totally going to depend on you to, uh, to vote on a couple of things when I get to the meat of the lecture. But uh, first and foremost, I want to uh, just say thank you for everybody checking in. It looks like the sound is working. And I see several of your comments about um, wanting to know uh, how to use different, uh, different um, um, approaches to the ketogenic diet. You know, one of the most powerful things that I do is not just live the ketogenic diet, but I taught my mom, who was 71 years old, um, about the ketogenic diet. I did it through writing a book when she had had cancer for 10 years and was ready to throw in the towel from her cancer. Uh, she was very sick when I was writing the book. I was actually not writing a book. I was writing little lessons for my mom. And that, um, thanks to the encouragement of my husband, I pushed print. And you can find um, that, um, that book on Amazon. That's the place I sell it right now. Um, the, uh, the other place that folks have really found encouragement is that they uh, tune into this channel, they put in their questions. We are getting better at trying to answer the incredible volume of questions. Um, but that uh, series of education through these free videos is one way uh, to support the channel, but also to, uh, to improve your own health. As an internal medicine physician, I have watched patients for the better part of uh, two and a half decades really decline in their overall health and uh, having only a, a toolbox filled with wonderful 21st century uh, prescriptions, but that wasn't doing most of the trick. I see a lot of comments about things that I did write about in the book, like ringing in the ears, tinnitus, thyroid problems. And uh, it's not expansive, but it's enough to get you the answers you're looking for. So as you look at that, we are gonna use uh, one of my favorite stories, which is Jerry. Um, Jerry has been one of the folks who volunteered to share his story live with you. So give a thumbs up uh, to Jerry. Uh, he read the book, <laughs> passed it around to a few of his uh, folks, and Jerry had suffered from diabetes for over 20 years. He um, was um, looking at his life last year in late 2018, saying his doctor was very adamant about saying his diabetes is not controlled, we're gonna have to increase the amount of insulin. Um, and Jerry was really frustrated because it was the time of his life where he's supposed to be enjoying uh, RVing. He drives a, a, a camper with his wife and sees the country, but it was a time where his health wasn't good enough to do and engage in that. So he read my book. He read, I think, Dr. Ken Berry's book. Both of us are primary care physicians saying there's got to be a better way to help patients. And the book started his journey. Uh, and before three or four months was up, he was off several medications. Um, but he really struggled with um, having blood sugars well over 200, uh, 150 to 250, um, and had stopped his insulin. And this was a place where I said, okay, he's had diabetes for a really long time. He has lost, uh, at the time I think he'd gone into his physician and lost something like 70 pounds, and um, he was like, why didn't my doctor get more excited about all the weight I'd lost? And the reason why is because he still had really high blood sugars. He'd been struggling with this high blood sugar for so long uh, that the danger signs of his fingers not working right and his toes not working right had really come into full circle. It was then that we put, uh, we put Jerry's story on the, on the show and uh, the first couple of weeks, I really coached him uh, very tightly. Uh, I sent him out to download the Dr. Boss spreadsheet, uh, which is an interactive spreadsheet built by another patient who really likes the data and engineering and kind of programming these things. But we use that work to pass it to the people who want to track themselves. So in the show notes, you'll find uh, download the Dr. Boss spreadsheet. Now, uh, keep in mind that if you have, um, there are sometimes it's ending up in the junk mail. We've done everything possible to try and minimize that, but we still do get a, a few stragglers that are getting it in their junk mail. So if you don't get it on the download, be sure to check that. And then most importantly, it allows you to check your numbers uh, and print that out for your doctor to see, or most importantly, for you to be able to follow. So if, you've, um, if you haven't done that and you're looking to step it up to the level of a ketogenic diet that uh, Jerry has, um, this, uh, that, that spreadsheet is one way to do that. Um, you are gonna need to have the ability to check your sugars. 
So one of the secrets that I think uh, about a ketogenic diet is you need a tribe. You need people helping you with your behavior. In the history of mankind, if you want to change something that you're in the habit of doing and you tell no one and you share your pain with no one, it's not gonna last very long. You're gonna have a hiccup and as much as you can haul yourself up by your own bootstraps, it can be a little difficult to do that time and time again. And the temptation of carbohydrates are everywhere in our world. So this is one of my steadfasts that you find a tribe. In my community here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, I, uh, I host a, a free support group on Friday mornings for anybody who wants to learn about the ketogenic diet or wants to see what a support, uh, support group looks like. Uh, we do that here at, uh, at my office space uh, in the conference room and we actually are outgrowing my conference room and need to figure that out. But what a great problem to have that so many people um, want to become part of a group that is improving their health. So um, uh, if, if those of you uh, have watched any Facebook stuff over the last couple of weeks, I've had a few support groups that have looked for, I've said, if you start, start a support group and you want um, my help at coaching you a little as the support group, I will zoom in or Facebook Live your support group and answer some questions as a free way to say, I really want these support groups throughout the country as a way for people to resurrect their health. Um, number one, you gotta have a tribe. So that's step one. Uh, number two uh, is something that I've been doing the last few weeks. Uh, I kind of switch back and forth between the two different types of uh, ways to get ketones in circulation that uh, are outside the diet. And I do that mainly because um, so many of the patients that write in or that come into the, um, send in an email, they are not as they're not healthy <laughs> they're a lot like jerry in that they have um really suffered actually really had uh, several health problems that have been going on for a long time and just like if you came into my clinic with a really high blood pressure i would definitely um uh, start a medication, seeing how severe that blood pressure is uh, when you first walk in the door, and then work on changing some of these behavioral uh, things over the next um, you know, weeks to months. Um, I love it when they dive in and they do an amazing job at getting their, uh, getting their numbers better, but what I am un unsettled by often is how they think the diet can do everything and that they don't need some help from the, what modern medicine can do. And one of those modern medicines is the exogenous ketones as well as the specific C8, C10 um, supplement that when you have a metabolism that's in the, in the ditch, it's not doing very well, um, there's several ways that we can help you. Many of those um, you don't need any, don't need a supplement. You just, you do need to have a ketogenic diet. You should be checking, tracking your numbers. Um, but when you're in a situation like what Jerry has been in, you can find a huge level of frustration uh, because they don't have um, the resilience within their mitochondria um, when they first start out on the ketogenic diet. So we're gonna use this as a, a jumping point to show you um, Jerry's story. I'm gonna hop over to this section, and I think this is Stacy's, so we're gonna start with Jerry. Um, there we go. All right, so this is Jerry, and when I look at um, Jerry's story, um, I like to remind uh, the, the, the people that the, he was not ketogenic a year ago. He, in fact, was what I would call, and what his physician called, an out-of-control diabetic. So if we go back to when he first started his spreadsheet, now one of the things about a Google spreadsheet, this is a Google spreadsheet that he and I share, is he enters the numbers in and I'll check on his spreadsheet a few times a week. Um, and then of course, before a live, I'll really review it and see if I can see some patterns um, for where he's been, um, where he might be having trouble. So let me just take a drink here. <laughs> okay. So if you look, <clears throat> this, uh, this spreadsheet starts out on September 2nd, and it shows you his fasting hours there. In the large blue numbers, that is his Dr. Boz ratio. And what we've said several times is that Jerry really needs to empty out his stored glucose and to really reset his insulin resistance. That sounds like a lot of gibberish until you're tracking numbers. 
So if you look at the beginning here, you can see uh, that he's got 18 hours, 24, 24 hours, um, 30 hours of fasting, and that correlated to, at 18 hours, he had a Dr. Boz ratio of 91. Then it uh, jumped down to 75. And then his uh, Dr. Boz ratio was about 81. Uh, and we talked to Jerry about saying, you know what, if you can keep that Dr. Boz ratio under 80, you're gonna see the fastest resurrection of what metabolism we do have left. Um, and whether or not we need certain medications are gonna depend on how this spreadsheet unfolds. So um, he continues to look at those for me and gets into September 4th. His, his fasting hours got up all the way to an 80 hours or 87 hours of fasting. I think um, by the time he fast, ended his fast, it was um, you know, close to that uh, uh, four days. And at which point I said, uh, Jerry, let's not do a four day fast. Your health has uh, gotten closer to the age of 70 and there are other health problems that you're managing. Let me teach you a better way to stress your system. And I mean the stress in a way that really watches his metabolism rise. So he was actually on the road with his sweet wife and they were RVing and said, okay, um, let's not take on fasting that heavy. Let's start with one meal a day and see where his numbers ended up. So OMAD, standing for one meal a day, uh, led to his glucose is well above 200. Um, then it would get down to, by the second day he did one meal a day, he was at 176. Uh, then his blood sugar the third day was 173. Um, and then uh, the, actually those were all within the same day, I'm sorry. The longer he fasted, you're right, there you go, um, actually, the lower his blood sugars got. Um, the next morning uh, at eight o'clock, he has that dawn effect we talk about, where every one of us has a very special gland inside our brains that senses when the sun is rising. The, uh, the, um, the gland is called your pineal gland, and that pineal gland will um, s trigger your body to say, hey, there are this, this human being is about to wake up. Let's send a signal to release some stored glucose so they can do their day. And unfortunately, uh, Jerry has had that signal overstimulated and uh, excessive amounts of sugar floating around. So he needed a really loud noise coming from his brain uh, to, his, um, to his adrenal glands and then to his liver. So his stimulation of releasing sugar in the morning is over exaggerated from the years of having too many carbohydrates, from being insulin resistant, and from having a high blood sugar. So that eight o'clock, um, that eight o'clock sugar shot way up to 232 and it's not because he had eaten. Um, he really was uh, still fasting at that point. Um, his his uh, ketones were 270 and that's when your ketones go up, your sugars, uh, excuse me, when your sugar goes up, the ketones will go down. That's a sense that your insulin is on the rise as well. Um, and his Dr. Bob's ratio showed that when it went to 85. So I show you all this pattern in hopes that you can imagine where Jerry started out. Cause we're gonna fast forward um, and you can check out the other shows where I really unpacked what happened to Jerry those first couple of weeks where I said, all right, one meal a day, just keep tracking until I can see a pattern and surely his sugars are still pretty high. Um, we then made sure that he was taking the glucophage or metformin. That is one of the medications that is very good for Jerry. Um, it helps that blood sugar go from outside the cell to inside the cell. So it really helps with that insulin resistance. It helps with a little autophagy. Uh, it helps um, with some cancer things as well, we think. That's a very, very small amount of data on the cancer stuff, but uh, enough for me to keep an eye on it, that's for sure. So as we look at the end of September, um, Jerry started doing what I asked him to do. He was first traveling around the country, so I asked him to, instead of have one meal a day, I said, Jerry, I need, now that I've seen your numbers for a little while, I need you to step into the much more difficult routine of having one meal every other day. So OMIAD, <laughs> I don't really know how you'd say that, but the abbreviation is there for you in the fasting hours where I said, if you wanna try to do this without uh, any other prescription medication besides the metformin, we need to have longer times in between when you eat. And I was able to deduce that by looking at his spreadsheet, by seeing, you know what, your Dr. Boz ratio really doesn't get below 80 for very long, or it pops right back up as soon as you eat. Um, and 
as much as he thought a four-day fast was going to be really remarkable, I said that's just not sustainable in his life at the age he's at. And there is some evidence to say that we're really running out of the best benefits for a, a fast at the age of 78 um, and getting past 72 hours of fasting. I wouldn't do that. Um, so I recommended a 48-hour fast between meals. So that's one meal every other day. So here's where he starts to do some of that. Um, and you can see, actually, I think he, st let's see exactly when he started that. Um, so I think, yeah, September 23rd, September 22nd. So there you go. So in like September 22nd, let's just say that's when he started one meal every other day. And he starts to see that his Dr. Boz ratio at the beginning will be that 138. And then it really goes down nicely to that, um, the level where you can see where he eats. You can see that clear over on the side of, um, the spreadsheet on the on the um, way to the right of the spreadsheet, and his uh, Dr. Bob's ratio got down to 50. Again, that's a sign that his insulin is very low, and we need times where his insulin, uh, the lower the Dr. Bob's ratio, the lower the insulin. So we need times where his body has been insulin resistant for so long that we have to give it a time of calm and very low stimulus for producing insulin. That means a fast in between meals that's not just an intermittent fast of four hours or eight hours, but something closer to 48 hours on a routine basis. But watch what happens next. So September 23rd, he's doing pretty well. Uh, then he gets to, um, he's got two cups of black coffee there. And um, at one point he ran out of some ketone strips, <laughs> which I would, I, he does such a good job of monitoring. I, I just need to have everybody send him a little praise for doing such a great job. So now we're getting into September 26th where he had his black coffee in the morning um, and he finally reached a BMI. I don't know if you can see the exc exclamation points there. Anything with a BMI that begins with 25, I tell folks uh, that's considered a normal weight. So for the first time in his adult life, at the age of near 70, he has reached a normal body weight, which is glorious for him. So that weight is down to 169 pounds. And you can see that that Dr. Boz ratio is now hitting into those 40s, 50s, and even 30s in between the meals. Um, it's at the meal time that you'll see, yep, it's gonna bounce back up, but look at how quickly that res re resumes into the lower numbers. Again, when these Dr. Boz ratios are under 80, it's doing a pretty good job for Jerry. And anytime he can hit a number below 40, um, his, his system does get um, is a reflection of getting healthier. So um, he has a life too. So you can see times where he had to go back to one meal a day because life hit. And this is really what I was worried about with, with Jerry was let's give you a pattern and a plan that you can stick with. Um, when that pattern and plan are not, um, uh, consistent, uh, then, then your system doesn't get that, that continuous tapping into the emptying of the storage uh, 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 for his glucoses and for the insulin resistant needs to have times where the body doesn't hear the noise of insulin. And unfortunately, Jerry's had lots of time where that did happen. So he goes back, he had some, had some company around, so wasn't able to do one meal every other day until we got to uh, October 8th again. Starts out with a Dr. Boz ratio of 104. Um, and let's see. Actually, I think th uh, he started the, the fast by eating at 11. So it's the next morning. And again, boy, he really shoots those sugars up in the morning. Uh, it's unfortunate, but that's part of being insulin resistant. Don't lose, don't uh, be discouraged. <laughs> um, but he is able to get that Dr. Boz ratio to 77, then 59, then 51. And it stays right in those 50s with ketone numbers that are 2.6, 2.8, 2.5, 2.8 very powerful uh, season for his metabolism at that point. So as I look a little further, then he gets, uh, he, he has his, uh, um, let's see, I think his, uh, I was just trying to see when was his, he, at 12 noon is when he had his steak, even though it says 10 p.m. there, he just didn't check his numbers there. So he's eating, not in the evening hours. We've warned him against that, that those evening hours sound like a good idea until you're looking at the numbers. And then 
it is powerful how much that will offset somebody with insulin resistance. Unfortunately, when you ask patients, what's your favorite time to eat? They'll all tell you the evening hours, the afternoon hours, I, you know, a siesta, I wanna you know, relax and I, I use food to do that. But if you have insulin resistance, that is the most difficult time to see the weight loss and to see the, the return of his metabolism to a normal level if he's eating in the evening hours. So he's been really good about that. Let me have it. All right, so then he goes another um, season of every, uh, a one meal every other day, watching that Dr. Voss ratio get down into the 32 range. That's so good. He has a blood sugar at that point of 91. Very good job. We've got more numbers now that are under 150 blood sugar than uh, like we started a month ago, a month and a half ago, where almost all of them were above 200, above um, or in that two, 20 to 180 was a, his, the, where most of his sugars were. So as you look, uh, going all the way down uh, through, uh, again, he had a couple times where life said, I can only do the one meal a day, and he plans around that, but then hops right back into one meal every other day as much as he can. Um, I don't know what TMTD means. <laughs> Too much to do, maybe? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but uh, a nice Dr. Paz ratio is blood sugar is 170 and his ketones are 1.8. Um, and then uh, you get into the last little part here where he has had one meal a day for the last several days. But even at one meal a day, um, you know, his, um, it, at first his one, he, he was able to hold that sugar of 167. Um, as he did this stressful season is what I was trying to point out. So October 18th gets a little bit of life, gets in the way of his, of his uh, resurrection of health. And when he goes back to one meal a day, um, you can see all of his sugars have shot right back up into that high 200 to 300 range. Um, this is a time of stress. You can see his Dr. Boz ratio just shot right up. And um, it is, it's, it's what makes this difficult for, um, for Jerry. Um, but uh, please give him a, just a, a round of applause or a, a thumbs up for the video for him uh, doing such a great job of showing you his, his intimate struggles. Um, you know, the things that I, uh, oh, I actually wanted to show you one more thing about his, um, about his, um, his labs here. Hold on one, one little second. Um, okay, so um, I wanted to flip over and show you his labs. Um, let's see if I can make that happen. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. So the labs, here we go. So, um, his labs, he has, again, this is just another tab on that spreadsheet gives you a chance to, um, look at what, um, what the, the labs, um, uh, have done over the course of his, his care. Uh, just watching that his hemoglobin A1C at the beginning started out to be 11.1. That's an average sugar of 270. And you can see that um, uh, that's why his doctor was so adamant saying, we really need to step this up. This is very dangerous for your body. Um, when he went in his November visit, his doctor said, yes, I know it's a little better, but it's still so high that you're killing off parts of you every week this goes on. Um, he was able to lose all that weight. And by May, he was down to a hemoglobin A1C of 9.7. And just in the last month has had a hemoglobin A1C down to 9.6. Still an average glucose of 220. Um, let's see if I can read that, <clears throat> 228. Um, so we have a ways to go, uh, but it is a powerful testimony to also look at what his cholesterol did. So his uh, HDL or his healthy cholesterol was at 43. And after being on a ketogenic diet for nearly uh, a year now, uh, he is he has almost like Im increased his uh, his healthy cholesterol, the good cholesterol by 50%. I don't have a medication that will increase a male's a male gluc or a male healthy cholesterol by 50%. There isn't. We have some that might increase it by a few points, but nothing that will um, you know increase it by half. Um, the other thing that's really powerful to see what he's doing is his triglycerides. We love those under 
um, 100, and he was 130 last year with a number of 103 at this point, so much, much improvement in that. And then to look at his LDL cholesterol is only at 50, um, and he has it at 62 after a year of a ketogenic diet. Again, I warn folks, do not look at your cholesterol within the first six weeks of a ketogenic diet. There is a lot of tide that changes during that time. Um, Jerry's numbers give you a really good teachable moment uh, about what uh, I would typically see in a patient who's got diabetes, who's been on medications, and now we uh, get to see his uh, his health do some powerful improvements. So Jerry's story gets to one of those secrets, and that is that number one, you gotta check. You gotta check and track, because if Jerry was only looking at his, his blood glucoses, when you saw him go back to one meal a day and the sugars shot right up to that 200 point, 250, 260, um, I, along with anybody who studies diabetes, would instantly panic with, okay, we, we have to find a way to lower these sugars that isn't just the ketogenic diet. We need something more. But by studying what his numbers have done over the last month, uh, especially when he does that one meal every other day, uh, it's difficult. It's really hard. Um, ha he, he can't... Uh, uh, no, even just by feeling, you can't know what your body's doing. And poor Jerry has had some frustrating moments in saying, can I do this? And of course, I'm telling him, don't give up. Um, I do think that his metformin that he's been on, 500 milligrams twice a day, we're probably gonna bump up a little higher. Um, when they're insulin resistant, it does take a little bit more medication uh, to do that than is typical. Um, and it's one of those medications, I get tons of people writing in about saying, can I use medications on the ketogenic diet? And most importantly, it depends on where you're at with your metabolism. Jerry is 20 years into this diabetes story and he is doing amazing better than any of my medications could do. But I still think he's gonna need the help of my medications before he can say sayonara to all the medications. The most important ones at the beginning of a ketogenic diet um, are the blood pressure ones. That is like, and you'll read that in my book, um, uh, which I don't have a copy of near me today. Um, the book I wrote, Any Way You Can, one word, any way, any way you can, is uh, it talks about what happens with blood pressure and how powerful it is to watch those first few weeks of um, a ketogenic diet if you're on blood pressure medicines. All right, so I do have another spreadsheet that I was gonna go to, but I'm looking at the time and I would like to do this interactive thing with you. So I'm, I'm gonna abuse you a little bit. I have this really scary thing to do tomorrow. I have to go to a high school and talk about, talk to um, high schoolers about something that I, w I want your feedback on. So this is not ketogenic, but I do think that anybody out there who's been paying attention to your teenagers, you're gonna find uh, this as a valuable way uh, to uh, update you really quickly from hopefully somebody you trust, which um, uh, before the ketogenic diet, what got me into the ketogenic diet was I repair brains, I work on brains that have fog, brains that have depression, brains that have Parkinson's, um, have concussions, that's my, that's what I love to do. And I ended up in the ketogenic diet after the data on how well a brain aged that had a seizure, that a seizure kid aged his brain uh, from you know teenage to death. At autopsy, their brains looked amazing. I had brain envy, um, and that's saying something for me uh, on the folks who had these uh, beautiful looking brains at autopsy because they had been super compliant on a ketogenic diet. That's what my first call, that's how I first got into this. That my mother got, my, my mother used it to repair cancer. In fact, I do have a moment to share with you. So Grandma Rose is now 75 years old. When the book started, she was 71. She'd had cancer for 10 years. Um, she has had times where chemotherapy, much like Jerry, we need to uh, combine modern medicine with the ketogenic diet. Um, and her white count, she's got a cancer of the white count of her white blood cells. Her white blood cell count had really risen and um, the doctor put her back on chemo about a year ago right now. She had five months of chemotherapy to the point where she was losing her vision. And she comes in really stinking mad to see her oncologist in about January saying, I am stopping the ketogenic, or I'm stopping the chemo. Um, and he really didn't have a choice to let her, <laughs> but to let her stop it. So she's been off, the, off of chemotherapy 
Um, and the first month she had left that appointment with a white blood cell count of like 70,000. One month off the ketogenic, uh, or excuse me, off of chemotherapy, on a very strict ketogenic diet, her spreadsheet had Dr. Ba's ratio of 20 or less for practically the whole month. She came back in and her white blood cell count for the first time in 14 years was normal. She had a white blood cell count of 10,000, which is considered normal after years of a white count of 60,000, 70,000, 150,000, lots of chemo. Uh, she was so excited. She went back home. She came back three months in a row and had normal numbers three months in a row. And now she's gone five months without checking her white blood cell count. And just this past week, she had her numbers checked again and they were 18,000, which in the world of her cancer is nothing. That is such a remarkable um, uh, journey for my mom to use the ketogenic diet to help her cancer that uh, I just need to give a moment of all of you that have prayed for her and, and, and really have engaged in the story of Grandma Rose from the book. Uh, what an amazing uh, uh, success story for her. But what does she do? She checks her numbers. She puts them uh, on the little Facebook group that we do and uh, she tracks it and she studies her own metabolism. So congratulations, Grandma Rose. All right, so now back to the thing that I want you to help me with. So I am going to show you um, what the lecture that I'm gonna give tomorrow to these, these teenagers. And the lecture involves questions, and that's where I need your help. So I need everybody to vote on what you think the right answers are for these five questions, and the topic is vaping. And again, I'm gonna tie this into brain stuff, so I hope you'll uh, really find it valuable, uh, and I hope that uh, you'll stick around for the final moment. So uh, let's start with, um, I'm gonna start with the question. I'm gonna put this question up. You aren't gonna be able to see me, but you're gonna be able to see the comments along the side. So as I read this question, you're looking for the false answer. Uh, there's five statements, and four of them are true, one of them is false. I want you to answer what you think is the false answer. And then I'm gonna go through and, te and tell you what the answer is, and then we're gonna go to number two. So this is supposed to be a 20 minute talk, so let's see if I can do this in 20 minutes. All right, so find the false answer. E-cigarettes or vapes use heat to aerosolize substances that, as they suck them into their lungs. E-cigarettes or vapes aerosolize substances to the lungs the same way a medical nebulizer does. E-cigarettes or vapes use aerosols that contain fewer toxic chemicals than cigarette smoke. E-cigarettes or vapes, most common aerosols include nicotine, THC, CBD, and dabs. And finally, e-cigarettes or vapes have become most commonly used teen tobacco product in the United States. All right, I want you to vote A, B, C, D, or E. Which one is false? There are four truths and one false. Okay, so, oh look, you've got some answers. So C is coming along. I've got several people who've said B. Uh, some who've said E, oh, this is perfect. Okay, one that said A, and um, oh, this is perfect. Okay, I am so excited, this is great. The engagement, that's what I want. Okay, so I'm gonna let you keep thinking about that, and as you um, continue to answer that, I am gonna go over and push play on the, the keynote for um, the answer here real quick. Um, let's see here. Uh, take away that and push. Oops, I gotta do it this way, sorry. Um. <laughs> oh, don't look at that one. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay, don't, don't look at that next question. Don't do that. <laughs> okay, let me go, let me go here. Okay, um, so again, uh, here is the, um, that's the question we are, that I'm get, trying to get you to answer. Uh, the second one is, um, I think I did that right. Oopsie, I gotta go back to here um, and push um, here, my bad. Okay, so 
Uh, the, the right question, the right answer for this um, is actually B is uh, the false answer. All the other ones are true. So let's go through that. So here is a picture of a kid who has a nebulizer. And if you've ever had a kid with asthma or a grandkid with asthma, those nebulizers take medication and enter it into the lungs. And my goodness, it is life-saving. Uh, some of the mission work that I've done in Haiti and in the Philippines, when they do not have access to nebulizing medication, the number of deaths because of this limited access is, it's shocking how much asthma treatment can be prevented because of the way we've learned to nebulize or aerosolize the medication. Uh, and I've had some knuckleheads come in and say, well, my vaping is the same as your nebulizer, at which point I, I'm thinking, no, <laughs> I don't even want to entertain this idea, but let me show you the science behind that. So here's an up close visu uh, visual of what looks like a medical nebulizer. And those green particles there are the medication that has been uh, lifted into the air. And as you breathe in, as the child breathes in or the patient breathes in, the medication gets all the way into their lungs where I need it to get. Okay, so here is some uh, just goofy stuff. The drug is there in blue, and that pressurized air solution is what is pushing the drug up into uh, particle sizes there. You'll see that the jet launches some particles that are bigger and some that are smaller. That baffle right there is what prevents the big particles from getting past uh, that little space, and it's only these tiny little aerosolized uh, particles that get to the, the area where the, the patient can breathe in that, that um, medication. The other, th <laughs> this is this word I have not used since medical school, this is called piezoelectric effect. And so again, you've got the drug solution there. We have electricity that runs uh, electrical current through a transducer, it's actually a bed of crystals, and that creates these acoustic waves in the medication. It launches those little particles into the air, and once again, the baffle prevents those, uh, those particularly large, or those large particles from getting past uh, the place where the patient can breathe it in. Here is how a vape works. It uses heat, much like a cigarette. So the battery delivers electricity to this high resistance coil. So the battery's there on the left, and then that circly thing, that uh, corkscrew thing is supposed to be the coil. You have the tank of liquid, which is, uh, it delivers the liquid to a heated coil, and it creates a vapor. Uh, these vapes have different sizes of coils and different intensity for coils, and that's what changes what, uh, how, how much the drug will launch into the air. What I really want you to take notice of is how large I tried to draw those particles in the aerosolized vaping section. Uh, again, it's not the same as what the physician, our medical grade uh, um, nebulizers do. And when I have patients come in and say, well, you're just trying to like have a market on vaping through drug, I'm like, no, no, that's not it at all. You are actually launching big Goombas of particles into your lungs when you uh, vape. Um, so here's another true statement. E-cigarettes or vapes use aerosol, aerosols that contain fewer toxic chemicals than cigarette smoke. Again, 7,000 uh, plus documented cigarette uh, substances are seen in cigarettes. This is not a difficult bar to meet. When you look at the fact that when e-cigarettes first came out or the vapes uh, first came out, uh, this was something that I heard all over the place. I even heard physicians in a couple medical conferences say, well, it's less toxins than the cigarettes. The problem is um, we didn't have any deaths at that point. Um, we did actually within the first couple of years, there was, um, th there was something that had uh, silicone in the, uh, the, some of the vapes had silicone. So the same thing we used to like, do breast augmentation, uh, or yeah, the, the silicone was being inhaled into their lungs and they, yeah. So uh, cigarettes won't kill you the first time you smoke them, but vapes can kill you the first time you smoke them. And I think that's a powerful statement now. All right, so we are going to have you vote again, uh, and I am going to read them out loud. So I, I really need you to, to put the, the voting into, um, into there. I will read them, and I want you to guess which of these is false. So again, there's five statements, four are true, one is false. See if you can guess the false one. So vape substances, find the false answer. The teens who died from vaping did not seek medical attention soon enough. 
B, heated coils in vapes deliver large particle size, large size particles into your lungs. C, the hotter the coil burns, the more particles are aerosolized into the vapor. The massive influx of particles into the lungs pull water into your lungs, causing a drowning effect. Or E, your immune system attacks the inhaled particles because it looks like an infection or a toxin. So again, one of these is false, four of them are true, I really want you to engage and uh, answer these. I'm gonna be in front of a bunch of teenagers tomorrow. They're gonna be on teams where they have to scratch off and find the right answers. And I just need to see that these are, actually they need to be difficult enough that not everybody gets the right answer. So please, please, please vote. And then I will advance and show you the answers. So I'll give you about 10 more seconds while I take a drink and then we'll go from there. Mm. Maybe while you're doing that, I'm gonna do one thing. I'm gonna go um, to this one and say, uh, this nebulizer is um, what I was talking about. So again, this is one of the piezoelectric effects where the uh, current runs, uh, a, a medica runs an electrical current through a transducer, and this aerosolizes the medicine that I use to treat asthma. It's super quiet. You'll know if you're using the pressurized air to treat asthma or if you're using uh, the piezoelectric because of how quiet it is. So um, this is as close as I'll ever get to vaping, <laughs> but there you go. All right, so that should give you plenty of time to answer that question. Uh, so let me go here and push play. Oh, actually I gotta do that wrong, oh, sorry. I'm gonna get this right yet. There we go, all right, so let's move on to that answers. So first of all, heated coils and vapes deliver large size particles to your lungs. That is a true statement. And when you look at a, how a vape works, um, it really is a, a direct comparison to what I was showing in the last question, where the particle size with that vape, they're very large size particles. Uh, when you look at whether the nebulizer comes from the jet or if it comes from that piezoelectric one that I was just showing you, these particle size are very important how small they are and how when they get into your lung, when they get deep into the lung, they actually deliver a medication uh, uh, right to the source of the problem with an asthmatic attack. Uh, un, uh, unlike what happens with the vaping, a large molecule comes into the system. All right, so question number, er, number two, a massive influx of particles into the lungs pulls water into the lungs, causing a drowning effect. And the other one, your immune system attacks the inhaled particles because it looks like an infection or a toxin. Both of these statements are true. Again, as the folks coming into the ICUs with the toxic injuries, they didn't know it was from a vaping uh, problem, the first few injuries we've had. Now, according to the morbidity and mortality report that just came out last week, I think it's over 34, 35 people that have died from vaping. Uh, the, the way they die is, um, is through a drowning effect, if you would, in their lungs, as well as an immune system that's really trying to defend the system. So take a look at this. This is a normal chest x-ray. Where those lungs are are nice and black. That means there's air in your lungs. <laughs> Just to make sure you're following me, that's a good thing. We want you aerating, right? Your immune system is uh, not doing anything goofy. This is a beautiful picture of a normal chest x-ray. This is a picture of somebody who's been vaping and they had inhaled some of those large particles. And what happened was that particle attracted fluid into their lungs and you can see that this is now a cloudy lung. It's not nearly as filled with air. It has moisture of some sort, of some sort in it. Part of that moisture is a, is a water-like substance, but it's also your immune system who's saying, hey guys, we have a problem. We have a serious invader that has come into the lungs and now we need to get it dissolved and get it out of there. So your white blood cells are just flooding into the lungs to say, hey, help me out guys, something's invaded the body. We gotta get these lungs cleaned out. We can't get enough oxygen in.
And finally, here is um, a stage of somebody who's very advanced into their ketogenic, or in, into their ketogenic, into their vaping uh, injury. Uh, again, the particles have been in there. There are, were lots of injuries put into the lungs uh, during that vaping section. And now you nearly have no spaces in the lungs that is filled only with air. It's filled with air plus fluid and the immune system trying to defend your poor little system. Just to look at it another way, this is a CAT scan. Again, black is beautiful. Black is where the air is taking care of that lung. You can see this is a patient's, um, this is a, a slice, uh, a CAT scan through the chest cavity. So if you look at the back side or the lower part of that picture, you'll see their backbone kind of in the very white dense area. The big circle in the center between those two uh, black kind of half shape um, upside down commas, if you would, uh, that's your heart. And you can see different chambers of your heart there, but nicely black lungs filled with air. Uh, this is a picture of a CAT scan of a patient who had been vaping, and now uh, they are a few days into the fluids filling up their lungs and the immune system just attacking that lung to make it um, a very dense problem. Here is another picture of a very advanced stage for this patient who's got nearly um, a scarring and a very white part of their lungs. You should never have that white of areas in your lungs. Um, uh, again, a very difficult thing to look at as a, as a parent knowing that this was an innocence, uh, doing something that all teenage do, teenagers do, which is experiment, and unfortunately, it's gonna cost that one their life. Um, this is another picture of a, of a chest CAT scan kind of slicing the patient from head to, to diaphragm there. Uh, and then this is a picture of what it looked like when their lungs were filled with all that fluid. Again, I think this really shows uh, just how damaging when you get those large particles inside the lungs uh, and then what your body does to try and defend yourself when you've put it very in, in the deepest part of your system. Um, this is just one of the reports that came out this past week showing us how much uh, this, uh, this report changed in one year. So again, the blue lines are for boys, the yellow lines are for girls. Uh, the, the dotted lines were from 2018. Um, is that right? Um, uh, actually, so sorry. Uh, blue lines are not, okay. The, the dotted lines are from, uh, uh, are the females. <laughs> Let's try this again. Whew. Okay, the dotted lines there are from the females. The solid lines are the males. The yellow ones are from 2018, and the uh, blue ones are from 2019. So looking at those dotted lines at the bottom, you can see that nearly every time we measured uh, from last year to this year, the number of people from age 14 to 30 coming into an emergency department with a, a severe, unexplained respiratory problem, uh, which the, the correlation to vaping has been enormous in this uh, last year, of, of what these patients look like. And again, the physicians did not understand, uh, we didn't know that this was causing this problem as it's been unfolding. They're, we're doing our best to get our brains and our protocols around what happens when folks come in with these severe problems. And then look at those young boys. Again, um, those solid lines are the boys. 2018 was their, uh, in yellow there, uh, was what they were last year. And especially uh, June or July, June, July, and August, uh, an es a very high uh, uh, escalation of the number presenting to the emergency room with these unexplained injuries. All right, so this you need to settle a uh, debate with me and my husband. My husband says I shouldn't teach teenagers this, but I really think they should hear from experts on how this works. Um, we are at our very core scientists and understanding how these things work are very important. So the question is the hotter the coils burn, the more particles are aerosolized into the vapor. And this also is a true statement. So if you look at the difference between some of these uh, vapes, um, you'll see that you can spend a little bit of money, a little more money, and some very serious money. Uh, and it really is the temperature that it is created by the coil. Um, so there's this really unbelievably sad uh, advertisement uh, on the internet that says, how hot should you smoke your weed? Now, if you've spent any time around me in my clinic, I again look at brains and how to heal them. So watching to see that someone is telling teenagers this just totally wigs me out. Uh, you have, um, again, uh, this is a testimony that if you are uh, using marijuana and you cannot write any better than this for the advertisements, 
it, it, yeah, let me talk about brains that are working well. So again, it just shows that the hotter they burn uh, that coil, the more that coil heats up that particles. Not only can they take those larger particles and get them into the lungs, they can also um, produce more particles uh, when they increase that the, the heat of the vape. Uh, unfortunately, it's the size of those big particles that then enacts their uh, their immune system and the scarring that's happening on the inside of those lungs. Uh, you know, you look at the folks when they would talk about cigarettes and saying, you know, I don't want the filter. I can pull it in really hot. I get a, a much higher hit of my nicotine when I, I smoke my cigarette without filters. <laughs> I mean, and then they would do all kinds of things like if I can get the cigarette to burn hotter, I feel like I get the nicotine faster. Um, also, not a good way to be delivering medication to anybody. So again, the teens who died from vaping did not seek medical uh, care soon enough. Um, that's, that's the false statement. They did. Uh, so here's, a part, here's an article that came out the last month. Uh, just looking at three, there were four of them, but I couldn't fit them on the uh, um, uh, the page. So here are some of the things that we're using when patients were entering into the hospitals. So the, the orange is the inhaled steroids, the, the red are antibiotics, um, the purple means we were putting a tube down their, their throat and trying to breathe for them, and the, the dark blue is hospitalizations, whereas the light blue is their outpatient or the, uh, the course of illness. Um, but here are those asterisks saying in the outpatient medical visits, these three patients, the one and three showed up for a uh, doctor's visit within a day or so of their symptoms. The doctors all started antibiotics thinking it was an infection. It wasn't an infection. It was an invasion from a toxin that they had inhaled, but that didn't come out in their history. Um, as the doctors worked really hard, these patients lived, but the one that died or in this, there's, there's about 30 of them that have died, but the one that died in this article and the ones uh, that have died, they show up to their doctors, they're asking for help. And unfortunately, as physicians, we think this looks just like an infection. And if we don't know that the patient has been vaping, if we don't have an awareness that this is happening, this patient didn't come back to see the doctor again until 37 days and this patient died. Um, again, incredibly tragic for an experimental phase of a teenager. Um, you know, it's supposed, life is supposed to have more forgiveness than that. All right, so my husband, uh, again, thinks I shouldn't teach them about how hot a vape gets their vapors, so if you give me your comments, you can settle a, uh, a marital dispute for, for me there. Um, but let's go on to question number three. Again, we have five questions, so we're almost, we're halfway done here. Nicotine inhalers, not e-cigarettes, I'm talking about nicotine inhalers. So again, um, find the false answer. Four of them are true, one of them is false. A. Nicotine inhalers release nicotine powder when you suck on the end of the inhaler. B, nicotine inhalers can be bought without a prescription from your pharmacist. C, nicotine inhalers deliver nicotine through the membranes in your mouth and throat and not through your lungs. D, nicotine inhalers are less addictive than vaping or smoking because of the slower delivery to the brain. And then E, nicotine inhalers are effective in helping smokers quit smoking. So I really want you to vote for this. Please take time to do that. I, I want to see, does everybody, can everybody see the true answer on this one or is it, uh, is it too easy for the kids tomorrow? Uh, I, I really wanna know what you out there know about nicotine inhalers. So, and I've, <laughs> unfortunately I have abused my children. They've all had to sit through this lecture and so I don't have a fresh audience anymore. So. Thank you for helping me. All right, let's go through this. Nicotine inhalers. Yes, I can write you a prescription. Nicotine inhalers have been around for a while and we do use nicotine inhalers to help patients get off of their addictive patterns, uh, 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 behaviors, having uh, a nicotine um, addiction from tobacco or um, usually it's tobacco. So again, this is what the inhalers look like. That cartridge in between those two things over on the side is what uh, it looks like. Here's just another way to uh, see what that nicotine inhaler looks like. My patients that use nicotine uh, vapes say, well, it's the same as your nicotine inhaler, but I don't need a prescription. And the problem with that is, uh, is that the nicotine inhaler um, that we use has um, this uh, inhalation of um, of nicotine that you suck in. We do not use heat and that nicotine lands on the mucous membranes of the mouth and the back of the throat. And like with nicotine inhalers, um, 
or nicotine that you smoke in or nicotine that you vape in. When you add heat to that nicotine molecule, it does get deep into that lung, just like a cigarette does, and you will see the, um, the, the rise of nicotine hit the brain at a much more addictive pattern of behavior. So the nicotine found in um, a nicotine uh, uh, inhalers is much like a transdermal patch, where when you put the patch on, this patch will deliver the nicotine over time uh, for the number of hours that the, the patch works. Usually there are 24 hours. Uh, sometimes I have patients take them off during the night, but um, just to kind of save them some money or they use half a patch and they use it for 12 hours. We use those to help um, you're not supposed to cut the patch, just so you know that. Uh, <laughs> the, they use that by the, the, the delivery time for getting nicotine into their brain is about 30 to 32 seconds, um, whereas when you inhale it, it's between four and seven seconds. And unfortunately, it is a big gun for releasing the nicotine, making it very addictive. So let's just make sure I covered that answer. So uh, the, the correct answer is B. Uh, you actually do need a prescription for nicotine inhalation. It comes from your physician. We use these to help people quit smoking, and it has been very effective in how patients have stopped smoking. They use the, the nicotine as a way to change the behavior and change the rush that they've been trying to seek from nicotine as we, as we slowly lower the dose. Uh, I've had lots of folks reach out over the last probably six months saying, I don't know how to quit vaping. Uh, one of the ways that we do this is we know that vaping and smoking are very addictive because um, um, the, of how quickly you deliver that nicotine to the blood circulation and then how much it delivers that rush to the brain. Um, all right, question number four. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, so again, uh, you're looking for, we've got five, we got four true answers and one uh, false answer. Again, this is my forte is brains and how they react. So help me find the false answer. Uh, pick A, B, C, D, or E. Brain swelling, uh, that's what the whole topic is for question number four. And vaped alcohol causes your brain to swell for two days. Or is it B? Again, we're looking for the false answer. So there's four truths. Vaped THC and CBD cause your brain to swell for up to three months. Vaped nicotine causes your brain to swell for up to two days. D, teenage memory returns to normal four days after using alcohol. Or is it E? Once a teenage brain has swollen, it stops maturing for up to six months. All right, place your bets. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> so if you haven't watched any of my brain lectures, these are spec scans. I do not do spec scans. I do not, I, I order them very, very, very rarely, um, but I use them to teach. So if you look at these spec scans, every place you see pink, think that's where the patient's eyeballs are. So pink means eyeballs as we look at this. We're gonna look at brains and what happens with their swelling. So the easiest thing to talk about swelling when I'm teaching teenagers, but also the general public is, what happens when a baseball bonks you on the head and you get a concussion? And the answer is your brain swells. How long does the swelling last? Well, um, it's about 48 hours that a brain stays swollen or it takes to get that fluid out of the brain. Um, when you look at a spec scan for where a brain is injured, this patient, again, eyeballs are near the pink. So this patient had a baseball to the head on the front right part of their brain. So right above their right eye, they were hit with a baseball. This, uh, this injury was actually documented six months after he had been hit. So his brain still wasn't working right. The swelling's gone, but his brain is not working right. Um, so here, once a teenage brain has been swollen, it stops maturing for up to six months. So you look at a concussed brain and we watch to see how well that brain gets back to normal. Once the swelling goes away, which takes about two days, that teenage brain has a protective process that says it really doesn't do the myelination and the the pruning and the, the reach out of all that, those neurons that happen in a teenage brain, it doesn't get really back into the full force of maturing for six months. 
This picture shows that the, uh, a, a brain at the age of five, and then it migrates all the way up to the age of 20. As you watch those, those um, uh, pictures in the middle, those are what happens in a teenage brain, where it is amazing how much their brain matures over those teenage years. And halting that for six months does change the trajectory of what their brain will look like as an adult. If it is constantly swollen, meaning they're getting a head injury every other day or every third day or every week, um, you're going to find that they, their brain stopped maturing at the time that that brain injury started to happen. So this is my favorite picture of all time. This is a picture of all of the dendrites in a teenage brain that is maturing. Uh, they are talking to other dendrites, they are talking to other parts of the brain. Uh, I tell teenagers that if you saw this in an adult brain, we would have like three little areas that do this. We stop doing this after the age of 26, uh, and it's much less after 21, but we think it goes on until age 26. And the key thing here is teenage brains stop maturing when they're swollen. Specifically, what you're sacrificing in these teenagers is the maturation of their hippocampus. That uh, hippocampus stuff is for another day. Here's a 37-year-old male. Uh, guess what this guy has? Again, you'll see that his injuries happen on the front side, the back side, the left side, the right side. Um, unlike that baseball injury to the head where there was really one injury, this is a universal place of injury. And this guy was a heavy alcohol drinker. Um, vaped alcohol, I don't care how the alcohol got to your brain. Uh, you vape it, it gets into your circulation. You drink it, it gets into your circulation. You can have people put it in anywhere next to a mucous membrane and it's gonna get into there. I didn't swallow it, doc, I just put it in my mouth and held it there for five minutes. I'm like, well, you absorbed it through your mouth mucous membranes, that's, I don't care if you didn't swallow the alcohol, that's why you feel fuzzy in the head. Uh, alcohol will change what your brain does. Just like you feel fuzzy in the head when you have alcohol, uh, when you have a concussion, same thing happens when I swell those cells from alcohol. And it does last for a couple of days. This is a powerful teaching point. Both of these kids are 15-year-old males. Uh, they have one who's never been a drinker and the other one who's a heavy drinker, but only on the weekends. During a memory test, they scanned their brains to look at how much of their brain was being used to solve these questions. Uh, and again, the test was done on a Wednesday. He wasn't drinking and he hadn't been drinking for the 48 hours before. Uh, when, you, uh, when you look at how much of his brain is offline, you can think, well, you know, what, tell me what that means relative to the rest of us. So here is the brain metabolism of a normal brain, and we're comparing it to one of my Alzheimer's, not mine, an Alzheimer's patient. So you, again, look that when our brains don't work right, we can't sort memory, we can't find where the memories are, we can't sort things. Again, the teenage memory returns to normal at four days after using alcohol, that's fake news, people, that is not true. Their memory takes weeks. In fact, it could be up to three months before that memory is really starting to file again, and again, a full six months before it's starting to mature again. So as you look at swelling in these teenage brains from the vaping, just because there's less toxins than a cigarette, it's not safe for these kids' brains. Again, here's a 26-year-old male. Um, I like to point out the really big holes in that front part of his brain. Again, you can just see that hue of pink off by where the eyeballs are. And again, this 26-year-old male, he was a daily user of marijuana. And so vaped THC and CBD swells your brain for up to three months. You're like, what? That can't be the true statement. Yes, it is the true statement. When we look at uh, THC if, and CBD, if I wanna see who's used that, uh, the way we would do it is, um, well, we would look at your fat cells. What are the fattest parts of our body? Our brain has a, and this says 60, but it's really closer to 70 or 80% of your brain is fat. It was the best picture I could find though. Uh, and the uh, other place that's very dense fat uh, is, your, is the uh, sex organs. So testes in males and ovaries in females. And if you want to see the outcomes of um, the sperm studies on kids who are smoking marijuana, again, that uh, toxicity of the CBD and the THC stays in those fat cells for three months. Uh, I, I really like uh, showing folks this picture too. The areas that your brain likes to put the extra THC into, the, into your brain is in the hippocampus, is in that really important part uh, of brain development in a teenager called the cerebellum. In fact, if you, you see that red part way at the bottom of that um, 
that uh, picture down there, that is your cerebellum way back here in the back of your um, brain. And if you look at the density, if you took that part of the brain and you weighed it, and then you took the rest of the brain uh, and you weighed it, the cerebellum would be heavier than the rest of the brain because of how much neural connectivity is happening in that part of the brain. Very important part of the brain and the development in those teenage years is super powerful. So again, the, the THC and the CBD really like those areas of the brain. I like to talk about how the studies we do to, to, to look into uh, THC and CBD are done on mice. Uh, we look at the mice models, we put them in their teenage years, we put them in the little tent where we put a joint in their tent so they're breathing THC. Uh, and we um, don't like to upset PETA. We like to uh, only test their brains when we know they've had enough marijuana but it's really hard to measure the dose of marijuana and if they've had enough. So um, this was a lecture given to me probably 10 years ago now. I, I've never laughed so hard. It was a great uh, uh, frontline scientist, bench scientist who was saying, here's how we check to see if our little mice have been high enough as their teenage brain developed because we are going to do an autopsy. We're gonna look at their brains and we don't wanna do that too soon. So they take these little mice, they put them in their tent, and when they wanna know have they had enough THC or CBD, they take the, um, they take the uh, needle and put it into their belly fat, and they do some liposuction. They take the, the fat cells out, squirt it onto a microscope, and see how much of the THC beads are found in the high-powered field of those fat cells. And it's just one of the ways to extrapolate the dose for THC. Uh, it just is another way to show you that we have studied this. We can watch to see which areas of the brain uh, take up those THC beads. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, this is one of my favorite stories to tell, is a, a teacher. Um, in high school, this teacher was amazing. He uh, was one of the top uh, students. He had an IQ of like 142 or something. Incredibly smart. And he in fact said, when I smoke weed, I slow my brain down and um, I do better on the test. And of course, my first thing, uh, my heart breaks for this guy because he really did have a very advanced maturation of his brain. He had a super gift from God of being so smart. And the way he was coping with dealing with the pressures of what do you do with that kind of a very enhanced intelligence is that he was going to be toxic to his brain. He was gonna put marijuana in and yep, it'll slow down your brain just like a, um, just like uh, a concussion would. Uh, and unfortunately, the concussion symptoms are gone in, um, in short order, but that brain development for somebody who puts a fat soluble molecule into their system, and he didn't smoke every day, he just smoked on the weekends. Uh, he became a teacher, and uh, that's how I got to know the, the story that's associated with this. Uh, his heavy uh, use only on the weekends became a point of contention in his mid to late 30s, um, at which point his beautiful brain had been damaged. Um, now, seeing this really helped him to, to kind of take notice that as much as he likes marijuana uh, and thought this was a safe thing for him, uh, the studies continue to show us that it's not. So, fat soluble. CBD binds to these cannabinoid receptors. CBD is found in the brain three months after they, they use it. Uh, CBD significantly reduces BDNF, and I've done a couple other lectures on that. CBD shrinks the hippocampus in the long-term studies, and CBD shrinks your uh, frontal cortex, the part of our brain where we make those executive decisions. Okay, last one, I know we're going a little long tonight, so thank you for those that have still stuck around. Uh, number five is uh, find the false answer. So, vaping, um, A, you're, again, four truths, one false, and so I would really like you to vote. A, uh, vaping solutions require no testing before selling to the public. B, the first e-cigarettes had no vapor or smoke that exhaled from them. They also had no added smells nor tastes. Vaping, you'll find alcohol, gasoline, heavy metals, essential oils and bacteria are commonly found in the aerosols of the vaping products in the United States. Vaping surges the dopamine due to the fast delivery of the chemical in the brain. And finally, nicotine and THC have the same addictive properties if you vape them or if you swallow them. Again, there is one false answer, four of these are true. So I'll just give you a few seconds to answer this and then we will wrap up this uh, public service announcement on vaping. <laughs> All right, 
keep voting, keep voting, keep voting. Uh, again, I don't want this to be too easy. So here is this, vaping surges dopamine due to the fast delivery of the chemical to the brain. Uh, nicotine and THC have the same addictive properties if you vape them or if you swallow them. So the first one of these, the vaping surges dopamine due to the fast delivery, yes, that is a true statement. However, the nicotine and THC uh, are, are less, um, uh, are less addictive when they swallowed them because the delivery system to their circulation was lower. And that really is where the answers of these questions come from. Uh, nicotine and THC have, do not have the same addictive properties when you swallow them. When you vape them, you deliver a large amount of those molecules to your lung and then to your circulation. That, re that does get to your brain and the delivery of the dopamine, the surge of dopamine is what correlates to the addictive properties. I mean, take heroin for example. If you wanna see the most addictive way to use heroin, they inject it into their circulation with a needle. Why? Because if they can deliver a fast level of that drug into their system, it surges the dopamine into their brain and causes a euphoria, and that is where the addiction comes from. Nicotine and THC, when they swallow them, it's much like using a patch, if you would, another mucous membrane that's absorbing, uh, and the delivery is slower. It doesn't make it healthier for you, it just says it's not as addictive when we use the mucous membranes from, uh, as opposed to the I just think it's interesting for people to see that dopamine sounds like this wonderful thing. Like if you take a psychology 101, they say dopamine, it makes us feel better. But I will warn you, dopamine has other effects. It causes pleasure and euphoria. Yes, we know that. But it, and it also is the part that gives us sexual arousal. Dopamine has that pathway as well. But it also is the problem that happens when people get Parkinson's and they have uh, an inappropriate dopamine surge, but it's for a different nerve in the brain. Same chemical, different area of the brain. And finally, when we look at the people who've got a depression, a fear, an anxiety, boy, that is dopamine related as well. So I know dopamine gets this really sexy uh, uh, term saying, you want dopamine and it gives you a rush, that's how we get high. But I am careful to show you there are four pathways in your brain that use dopamine. And when you send them off kilter, boy, they are uh, a bugger. Again, methamphetamine is one of the best ways to, to raise dopamine. You'll know this by how addictive it is in our communities. And if you've ever seen somebody in the advanced stages of a methamphetamine addiction, this is just a picture of someone's brain. But that sinister looking fellow there is what I think of when you look at the, the mismatch of dopamine and a, and a very diseased brain where they have paranoid ideations, they get um, emotionally unstable, they have panic, they're fearful, uh, they are very violent, uh, they have delusions that seem so real to them. Um, they're hyperactive, they lose focus, and they don't sleep. Um, again, vape solutions do not require testing. That's been what the, our, our um, political s services have been looking into the last month. Um, I would just tell you that please do not trust these uh, solutions that are out there. It only takes one trip to an ICU where one of these kids is dying to say it is an innocence. They shouldn't have to be fighting this at such a young age. Um, those first e-cigarettes did not have an exhale. They really did have inhalation without an exhale of smoke. They weren't as hot and um, they weren't as addictive because it, again, they weren't as hot. They didn't have smells with them. They weren't targeting, um, again, the, the sweeter tastes and flavors. They were strictly inhaling nicotine at first. Uh, and as much as that heated coil would get a lot more nicotine into their lungs and a lot higher particle into their lungs as opposed to absorbing the nicotine on their mucous membrane, um, they have changed the game where they've really heated it up. They've made it so that you can see that exhale, which is part of that addictive patterning that they're teaching young children about how uh, to become addicted to a substance that goes in through their lungs. Um, this is a true statement. Alcohol, gasoline, heavy metals, essential oils, and bacteria are all commonly found when they were testing these uh, substances of vaping. Uh, so again, uh, I, I know this wasn't keto, and that may be kind of annoying to some people, but um, I am in my very, uh, very um, core a, a public servant for health. And um, when my son <laughs> came home the other day and said, hey mom, uh, the guy who was supposed to do the vaping talk is, um, is can't make it. And I told the counselor that maybe you could do it. Um, I take that as a badge of honor that my son would be willing to let me come into his school and teach. Um, and then it only takes the heartbreak of a parent watching another parent bury their child 
because of this innocence that the kid thought this was just an easy thing to get away from. You can die the first time they vape and there is a, uh, a heartbreak that goes out to the people that I've watched um, bury their children from vaping. So please have the conversation with your kids. Um, I'm gonna end with a quick check of my numbers and say, you know, the best way you can support this channel, I, I know this was, a, again, a, a rift on uh, uh, vaping, but the best way you can support this channel is if you have read my book, please leave an Amazon book review. I am an independent author. I do not have a marketing team that uh, that promotes the book, but every time a patient writes an, a review article for me or a review on Amazon, it gives uh, those out there that haven't heard of the book uh, a better um, chance of seeing the book. So thank you for everyone who has written a, a, a book review. If you want the best teaching tool I've ever written on ketogenic diet, it was the one I wrote for my mom. <laughs> uh, and I tell you that because it is um, the basics, but it also gets into the deep science about why uh, do we have a, um, why do I want you doing a ketogenic diet? It isn't just for weight loss. So yeah, you can see, you can see that uh, I get stressed during these things. My sugar was 90 when I started, and now it's 104. But boy, oh boy, do those ketones work. Uh, again, not only do I test my own solution, my own system as I fast, but if you're looking for the best products that are out there, I am very much a stickler of what goes into my products, and I encourage my patients to test it. Look at the difference of 40, or whatever it's been, 45 minutes minutes since I finished that, um, um, maybe only 20 minutes since I've been done, uh, of exogenous ketones. And although I have an, I'm a keto adapted, when I fall off the wagon or if I'm in a fast and I just feel crabby, um, I'll use those supplements to get me through a hiccup. I use them less and less the better I get at this. But uh, just like Jerry is struggling to see, can we get his immune system or his uh, metabolism to uh, reach the heights that we want, um, I would absolutely tell him that um, during his fast, if he's struggling to get to every other day, use exogenous ketones until we can get that uh, um, metabolism stronger. Don't give up, Jerry, and thanks for sharing with us. All right, I'll go back and look at your comments. I really appreciate you sticking with me this long. I know it's been a long post, but um, wish me luck with the teenagers tomorrow. <laughs> Probably much more scary than the thousands of folks that watch you on YouTube. All right, good night guys. This is Dr. Vaz, I'm signing off, improving your health one ketone at a time.